One of the things that I love that Paul does is Paul spends a lot of time in his letters writing out his prayers for the people that he is writing to. And oftentimes he'll start a letter with a prayer like he does in the Colossians. And, and so what I want to talk about today is the power of prayer in the lives of others. But oftentimes, when is it that we pray? When do we pray for people? Problems. Somebody? When they have problems. When they have problems. We pray for people when they have problems. If you look at our prayer list on Wednesday night, it says pray for this person, problem. Pray for this person, problem. Pray for this person, problem. Do you understand where I'm going here? We're really good about running to the aid of people to pray for them. But have you ever noticed that when Paul prays, and Paul writes out his prayers, he doesn't say, pray for Jedediah, because he's not feeling well, and I prayed for Mary, because she's this, and I prayed for this person. Paul doesn't pray that way. Paul's prayer is based on a completely different idea. Paul's praying for them proactively so that they won't wind up needing all the reactive prayer. We make our prayer life reactive based upon what Satan is doing instead of getting out in front of Satan and praying him off before he comes. And so, open up with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Got to get my water. And we're only going to look at five verses today. Now I need my glasses. I'm telling you, some days. I got to my office this morning and I thought, you know, I'm going to go through the video a couple of times and I'm going to read through the directions and everything just to make sure I got the song down. And I got to my office with the video box in hand and the video was still at home. <laughs> and the book that I thought was in my office was in the van. And so, yeah, but at least I have my glasses and I have my water, thanks to Ron. But uh, Colossians, and we're only going to look at five verses because we're only going to look at the prayer that Paul prays. Paul starts by saying, for this reason. As he starts, he says, for this reason, because what he's doing is he's going back and saying, I want you to know why I pray. And really, the why here is because of everything that has just been told to him. Everything that he has just said in the previous verses, Paul says, and for that reason, this is how I pray. Paul says, because Epaphras came and told me about all the amazing things that are going on in Colossae. Because of the fire and the passion that burns in so many people there, because God is moving and doing a work, and basically Paul's saying, in a church, I never started. For this reason, this is how I pray. Because of all the good things that are going on in that church, I'm praying this way. And it's important that we understand the foundation for Paul's prayer. Paul's not praying to a church that is inactive. He's not praying for a church that is highlighting persecution. He's praying for a church that is active and moving. Where good things are happening. Because God is being obeyed in all things. And so Paul starts off for this reason. It says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God. Now, watch what Paul begins to ask God for. 
And when he says he hasn't stopped praying, that doesn't mean that Paul spends all this time praying, but that he lives his life in a continual state of prayer where he's always bringing things before the Lord. He says, I've not stopped asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. I have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Filled with the knowledge of his will. I mean, what a place to be. The idea of filled is not just that something is full, but that it is overflowing, completely and totally filled, or controlled by, if you will. The word filled is the same word that was used when, when it was described in Acts that the, that the apostles on the day of Pentecost were filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the kind of idea that is now being portrayed where they were, they were totally and completely controlled by the Spirit as it began to move. This is what Paul's praying. Paul's praying that this church would be completely and totally controlled by the power of the Spirit as they are filled They are filled with knowledge. It's because knowledge becomes a powerful tool in changing how we think. Because there is no self control without mind control. <coughs> I mean, I can, I can look at something and know that if I touch it, I'm going to be hurt. But if knowledge doesn't change the way I live, it doesn't matter. And you see, so often the problem with this word is that it becomes information that doesn't com complete into transformation. And a lot of us know a lot of things and we keep them stored up here, but we don't allow what we have stored up here to begin to change how we live. I mean, most of us know we're not supposed to be angry. How many of us still get there? Most of us know we're not supposed to harbor resentment and bitterness. Anyone besides me still do sometimes? You see, most of us know the information. And so it's not just about knowing information. It is about the way we know information. Because I can know something and I can know something. See, Paul is calling them to a deep understanding so that self-control can come from mind we have totally and completely given our minds over to the Lord. So that He is now able to change the way we live. And then He says, but not just knowledge, a certain kind of knowledge. Knowledge of his will. How 
How many times have you thought, God, I have no idea where you're leading me? God, I have no idea of the plan that you have for me. I know you put me here. I know you dropped me in the middle of 29 Palms. And Lord, I know you placed me at the First Baptist Church, but I have no idea, Lord, what your plan for me in my life is. I have no idea what my tomorrow looks like. All I know is I'm living one day at a time waiting for that vision. Paul says, my prayer for you is that you will be filled with the knowledge of His will. That you will understand totally and completely what God's plan in your life is. And I have to be honest, when I went to this conference that I went to a couple weeks ago, it was all about discovering God's will for your life. It was powerful. I came home and for the first time in years I felt like I was ready to live my life on mission. Because so many things had cluttered my life that I lost sight of my mission and why God has placed me here. See, once I understand what God's plan is, everything changes. Once I understand what God needs me to do, things become so much easier. And that's where Paul begins to now go, because once he says, I pray that you will be filled with the knowledge of His will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding, he says, and we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord, may please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you might have great endurance and patience. Paul says, once you understand what your purpose is, once you know what your purpose is, once we know our purpose in our lives, everything begins to change. If I know what God's plan for me is, it begins to impact how I live my life. Because now I can live on purpose so I can live with purpose. I know what God has called me to. I know the places I'm supposed to be. I know the people I'm supposed to reach. And I know how I'm supposed to live in front of them. So it begins to change how I live my life. And as I change how I live my life, fruit begins to be produced. And it's not always the fruit of eternal life that's produced, but it's a fruit that is planted, the seeds that are planted in people's lives. And you don't know when that seed is going to be harvested. You don't know when that seed is going to grow. But God has not called us to keep track of numbers. God has called us to plant seeds. God has called us to harvest seeds sometimes that others have planted. But you see, fruit begins to be produced. When I live my life on mission, we live our life on mission. And we allow our mission to change how we live our lives so that we intentionally live to be used by God. It cannot help but to produce fruit. But it also changes how we live because we want to produce fruit. We want to be in a place 
where people begin to see us as one who belongs to the Lord. Because we understand that the things that we are doing are intentionally being done so that we can be on mission in our lives and we know that we are in the process of proclaiming the risen Lord to people. It begins to matter how we live and the things that we say and the things that we do because people are watching us. And what we don't want is to be disqualified from the race because of the things that we say and do. And it doesn't mean we have to be perfect. The most exciting thing is sometimes when someone who you're sharing the gospel with says, yeah, you know what, I remember a couple of months ago when you did this. And they begin to hold you accountable for your actions. And you say, yeah, I blew it. I was embarrassed by that behavior. I don't like to be that person. And they're like, really? That's your response? You didn't make excuses? You didn't blame anyone else? You owned it. And they begin to realize there is something. And as we begin to live differently, as we begin to live on mission, the next thing that happens is we begin to grow spiritually. As we live on mission, we begin to say, you know what, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I need you. Lord, I need you to intervene in my life so that these things don't happen and these things do happen. Lord, I need you to come and do a miracle in my life in a way that only you can because I can't do the things you've asked me to do without you. And so we begin to invite God deeper into our lives, trusting Him in new ways, saying, Lord, I'm living on mission because you gave me a vision. I know what it is you want me to do. I know how it is you want me to live. So now, Lord, what I need is you to make it happen. Because, Lord, you know I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm going out. And as we go, and as we begin to live on a mission, as we begin to live fulfilled in who we are, we begin to encounter trials differently. See, I love that Paul doesn't even pray, really, about the trials that they're going to face. Paul says, I'm praying all of these things into your life because that way, when you live on mission, when you live fulfilled, doing the things that God has asked you to do, reaching the people that God has asked you to reach, living on mission in your life, when the trials come, you deal with them differently. We deal with it differently because we're living differently. So often in life, we come to that place and we get caught up in the storms of life and the winds are blowing. We're just like, ah, oh, not again. We're just like, man, I'm never even going to get out of the harbor. Because every time I try to move, the storm comes and just destroys me. See, we oftentimes don't know where we're going once we get out of the harbor. Because we have no clear understanding of His will, we just think, I'm going to try to get out of the harbor today. And if I get out of the harbor, maybe something will happen. And we 
begin to set sail and Satan says, <laughs> not today. So we go back. Like, yeah, this is not worth it. And we feel it's not worth it because we don't have a vision for our ministry. <coughs> We don't have a vision for the mission that God has given us. But man, when God breaks our heart for something, He says, This is what I need you to do. And we've heard clearly from God, nothing else stops us. That's why Paul doesn't pray, Lord, stop the storm. Paul says, Lord, change their mindset. Give them the vision of where they're going, of what they're doing, so that when the storm comes, they're heading out of the harbor either way because they know where they're going. And they will not be deterred. So Paul first begins to pray for all of those things. And then he says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saint and in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. Paul says I want to talk about what and now I'm going to remind them of the why the why is everything that you has done the love of Paul just kind of says change lives have so many reasons for praise and that's what he's doing he's just listing reasons for praise Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you. I love that word. He's qualified you. There are so many things in life that are about qualifying. In baseball, the Little League, we have a regular season and everyone qualifies to play. And then at the end of the regular season, we have all-stars. And certain people qualify to play in all-stars. And we get together and we have a tournament with other teams in our district that have qualified. And then some teams advance. One team from each tournament qualifies to advance to the next level. And from our district, we go into Section 9, and we have te districts, teams from districts in Section 9, and they come and we play those that qualify. And from all of Section 9, one team qualifies to move on to the state or regional level. And then in some divisions, the winner of that qualifies to move on to an international tournament of teams that have qualified. And man, what a lot of work. Qualifying for anything takes a lot of work, but it says the Father has qualified you to share in the inheritance. Talk about a reason for praise. It wasn't because of the things that I did. It wasn't because of all the work that I put out. I didn't have to earn my inheritance. It was given to me. It was given because he rescued me from the dominion of darkness. What a reason to praise 
He snatched us out of Satan's grip and placed us in His. And so our mission, our mission then becomes being used by Him so that He can take others out of Satan's grip and place them in His. I love what Paul prays. Paul says, I pray that you understand the mission God gave you. Paul says, I pray that you know the purpose that he has created you for. Ephesians 2.10, which is my life verse, says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for works that he prepared in advance for us to do. See, a loving God created you, molded you in your mother's womb. for works that he knew were necessary to be done. Because he destined us for victory. God knows who we are. God knows the things we can do. He knows the things we can't do. God knows the things that, that hurt us. He knows the wounds and the scars that we have. He knows our insecurities. And He says, I'm going to take you, pluck you out of Satan's hand, and give you a purpose. But the key is, what is my mission? And so Paul's prayer begins with, you need to know your mission. So I want to challenge you this week. To sit down and write out your personal mission statement. I wrote mine out. Next week, if I remember, I'll put it up on the PowerPoint. This is my mission statement. This is my purpose. This is the missional activity that God has given to me. And as you write it, I want you to prayerfully talk to the Lord. Lord, I want to know the people you want me to reach. The how is not important. But the statement is, who has God created me? Because when you have that, You now have a purpose for overcoming the storm as you try to leave the harbor. Could you imagine a church where the people in the church live on a mission? And the power that comes with that. I love that he calls it walking in the glorious strength of the Lord. That church is what we need to call to. If you need help with your mission statement, please call me. I would love to help you walk through it. Understanding how God is created. And let's get on mission with Jesus Christ. And let's change 29 Palms for
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, what a wonderful opportunity, what a wonderful prayer Paul gave. Paul said, Lord, I pray they live on mission. Because when they live on mission, nothing will deter them. Just like when we have a mission, Lord, to go get something from the store. Stop signs don't deter us. Rain doesn't deter us. Because we're on a mission. Lord, may we live our lives that way as we 